This is a basic kit lens that comes in the box with the camera. It's a zoom lens which means that you can change its focal length by just dialing backwards and forwards. Focal length is basically how wide or zoomed in your image is. And this lens here starts at 18, indicated there. And when you're set to 18, you're going to get quite a wide image. It zooms in to 55 millimeters. You adjust the focal length by using this big zoom ring here and you twist it backwards and forwards and there's a white line which indicates which focal length you're currently set to. As I've already mentioned, when you're zoomed in, you're more than likely to get a degree of camera shake, and that's because zooming in magnifies any of your movements. Another downside to zooming in, especially when you're using a standard kit lens like this, is that less light is let into the camera. Unless you're using a flash, this means that you have to open up the shutter for a longer period of time to get the correct exposure. But this longer shutter duration also allows for a greater chance of the final image being blurry due to camera shake. This lens does have inbuilt technology to help you avoid some degree of camera shape and different lenses call this feature different names like vibration reduction or image stabilisation. And that's what we've got here on the side of the lens, image stabilisation. So at the moment it's turned to off. If I switch that to on there. It's a good idea to keep this set to on, especially when you're doing anything that's handheld. And it does make a difference, but it's not going to be able to deal with significant amounts of camera shake. The other ring on the lens is the focus ring here at the front and you twist it in much the same way that you do the zoom ring so it goes backwards and forwards. But it only works if you've got this switch here set to MF which stands for manual focus. So if I switch that now. When you're taking photos the choice between manual focus and autofocus really depends on what kind of photography you're doing and what you prefer. I'm more interested in documentary photography which requires speed so generally I don't use manual and I find that autofocus does a really good job. But if you're doing landscape photography or portrait photography, you might want to take control over the camera and have it in manual. If you're shooting video, there are different things that you need to consider, and I would generally go for manual focus rather than auto, but we'll get onto that later. Making sure your images are in focus is a fundamental of both photography and video. Getting good focus is something that takes a lot of practice. You may need to train your eye by practicing on something like words on a page, as it's very clear when they're out of focus. If you're struggling, then there is a trick that you can use to assist when you're focusing in manual. Let's just take this lens cap, and if I half press the shutter button down and dial the focus ring backwards and forwards, you should hear it beep like so, and that means that it's in focus and every time I dial past it, it will focus again. So that's a useful little trick that you can use just to make sure that you've got your image in focus. So that's the lens. Now I'm going to take a more in-depth look at the LCD monitor. This is what you see on the screen when you're in auto mode. I'll just point that to the camera over there. As you can see, in this mode and in a few others, Canon holds your hand by telling you what the camera is doing for you. So at the moment, AF or autofocus Brightness, flash and colour tone are all being set by the camera, according to what you point it at. There isn't much that you can do in this mode apart from point and shoot, but there is one thing that you can change and that's drive mode. Drive mode allows you to take either one photo, a rapid succession of photos or put the camera on a timer. This rectangle here means that the drive mode is currently set to take only one photo. To change it, you need to press the Q icon which is here on the screen. Q stands for quick control and it gives you quick access to certain functions. At the moment, no other part of the screen is responsive apart from this Q icon. That's because you don't want to press anything accidentally when you're looking through the viewfinder with your face pressed up against the screen. If you open the LCD monitor up and have it out like this, you'll notice that the Q icon has jumped over to the other side of the screen. This is just because you hold and use the camera differently when the monitor is open like this and the layout of the screen is designed to be responsive to that. So let me just put this back in, and then if we press the Q icon here, we get access to the quick control menu. When you press the button, this bar comes up with all the drive mode options. If you press the bar, you'll enter into the drive mode menu, like that. Now you can select any of the modes by pressing the appropriate icon on the screen, and it's easy to choose because the camera gives you a small window of information telling you what that mode does. So that's continuous mode, that's timer mode. I want to stay in single shot mode for the moment, so I'll press this. You press the icon again to confirm your selection, and then if you press the return arrow, you'll get back to your shooting screen. 
Alternatively, you could just leave the camera once you've made your selection and after a few moments, it'll automatically return to the shooting screen with your selection in place. There's also a quick way of returning to shooting once you've made your selection and that's by simply pressing the shutter button down halfway. Below the drive mode icon, you can see this L here. L stands for large, which is the size and quality of the photos that you're going to take. Next to that, you've got a number, and this number indicates how many photographs you're able to fit onto your SD card, which of course depends on the size of the photos you're taking and the capacity of the card. There are various ways that you can change the size of the photos, but we'll touch upon these later. Moving on the screen, you've got this battery icon here, and that tells you how much battery life you've got left. As you can see, my battery is full. And then just above the battery icon, you have this grayed out icon here, which says ISO Auto. It's grayed out because I can't actually make any adjustments to ISO whilst I'm in auto mode. ISO is a measure of sensitivity to light, and it comes from the days of photographic film, when you could buy specific film types for specific lighting conditions. Nowadays, the ISO setting changes how sensitive the camera's imaging sensor is to light entering the camera through the lens. Lower ISO numbers are less sensitive, so these are used for situations with a lot of light, such as outdoors on a sunny day. Higher ISO settings are more sensitive and allow you to take photos in low light conditions, but higher ISOs will also result in what's called image noise, which gives you a more grainy picture. In auto mode, you don't need to worry about ISO settings as the camera selects this for you when you press the shutter button. So if I just do that now, I'll show the camera over here. If I press the shutter button halfway down, the flash will pop because we're in a dark room. And there you've got a reading of 1600 on the ISO. And that's because we're in this dark room, the camera needs to be more sensitive to light. On this camera, the level of grain I'd get at 1600 isn't too bad, but be aware that as your ISO increases, so will the level of grain in your images. Above the ISO icon on the screen, two other numbers appeared when I pressed the shutter button, the F number and the shutter speed. If I show you now, if I just press down, you'll see these two numbers appear in here. Together, the F number, the shutter speed and the ISO are what determine your exposure, and they're often referred to as the exposure triangle. They all affect each other, and setting the correct balance of these three elements is another fundamental part of photography. The F number refers to the size of your aperture. Like the iris in your eye, the aperture is basically the hole in the lens that the light passes through. The wider the hole, the more light can pass through. Wider apertures have a lower F number. At the moment, the F number on this camera is 3.5. If I show you again, there you can see it's 3.5. That's as wide open as this lens can get, so it's letting in as much light as possible. On the other end of the scale, you can get an F number of 36, which is a very small aperture opening that will only allow a tiny amount of light in. Shutter speed refers to the length of time that the shutter opens to expose the camera sensor to light. At the moment, the camera is setting a shutter speed of 1 over 30, and that's a fraction of a second, so the shutter is going to be open for 1 30th of a second. If I just show you here on the screen, you can see it there, 1 slash 30. As we've already mentioned, the longer the shutter opens, the more likely the photo is going to be blurry due to camera shake. You're also more likely to get motion blur. This is slightly different from camera shake, as it occurs when your subject moves while you're taking the photo, and it looks like this. It's easy to avoid motion blur and camera shake by using the flash, which you may have noticed has popped open every time I've pressed the shutter button. This is what happens in auto when the camera sensors are seen without enough light. It's worth mentioning that in auto, if I were to move to a scene where there is enough light whilst keeping the flash open, it wouldn't go off. When it does go off like this, you get a photo that looks like this. Personally, I don't like flash photography that much, but you can't really avoid it when you're in this mode. If you did want to avoid it, you'd have to choose a different mode, flash off, which is just here. Flash off mode is just the same as auto, but with one obvious difference. It doesn't operate the flash when there's not enough light. So be warned that using the camera in flash off mode may result in dark images that might be prone to camera shake. Changing to different modes here changes the information that appears on the back of the camera on the LCD monitor. And it also changes the functions that you can access via the quick control screen. I'm not going to go into all the different things that each mode can do, but I will give you a brief overview. Then I want to take you into manual mode and show you how to take full control of the camera. You'll notice that the mode dial is divided into two sections, or what Canon calls zones. Auto is part of the basic zone, which is all of these modes here. All these modes allow you to operate the camera as a point-and-shoot photographer, with the camera doing the bulk of the work for you. 
These first three modes are all variations on auto, and we've already talked about seem intelligent auto and flash off, which are these two. This third mode here is called creative auto, and it allows you to play around with things like the ambient look of your photos and the amount of background blur or depth of field without having to dig into the complexities of the manual settings. The next five modes, which are these modes here, are designed to meet specific needs of different shooting scenarios. So if somebody wants to shoot a portrait, then they'd select the portrait mode, which is this mode here. And the camera will help you blur out the background and give the hair and skin tones a nice look. And if you're shooting a sports event, then there's this sports mode, which is here, represented by the small running man. This will help you capture action by putting you in a continuous shooting mode with a fast shutter speed that helps you freeze fast moving objects with minimal motion blur. This last one here is called special scene mode. It gives you two options for shooting at night and another one for shooting scenes with extreme differences in light, such as a dark room with a bright window. This mode is actually quite useful, so it's worth talking a little bit more about it. So let me quickly show you how it works. So when you select this mode, you get a screen that's very similar to the auto screen, but it has a few other options. So if I press on the Q button now, I can show you through some of those options. If I press the Q button, and then if I press this icon up here at the top, this allows me to get access to the three different modes that I've just talked about. You've got this first one, which is night portrait, which basically helps you take a portrait in low light conditions, but it does suggest that you use a tripod. Let's go back into that. The second one is called handheld night scene. Now this one's quite interesting because it lets you take usable photos at night without a tripod. We've already talked about how low levels of light can often lead to blurry photos due to camera shake. Well in this mode, the camera overcomes this problem by taking four photos and merging them together to get one sharp picture. And the results are really quite good. The next option does pretty much the same thing. So let's just go into that. It takes three photos and then merges them together in one combined image to compensate for big differences between light and dark areas within a scene. It's called HDR Backlight Control, and HDR stands for High Dynamic Range. So imagine you want to take a picture of a mountain landscape. Normally, it would be impossible to expose both the sky and the mountain correctly due to the scene's wide dynamic range. Wide dynamic range is the difference between the brightest area and the darkest area, and you're either going to get an image where the mountain is too dark or the sky is too bright. But in HDR mode, the camera takes three photos, each with a slightly different exposure, and then it combines them together so that both the mountain and the sky are correctly exposed. Just a word of advice though, high dynamic range photography only really works on a relatively still scene, and it's best if you've got the camera on a tripod, otherwise there'll be slight differences in each of the pictures, which could ruin the result. So that's the basic zone. On the other side of the mode dial is the creative zone, which are these four icons here. These modes are all variations on manual, giving you creative control over the way your photos look. M, which is this one here, stands for full manual, which means you have full control over the camera's operation. Below that you have AV, which is this one here. This stands for aperture value, and that's the aperture priority mode. In this mode you set the aperture or the F number, and the camera will set the shutter speed for you. This is useful if you want to control your depth of field, which is how sharp or blurry the background is in comparison to your subject in focus. A wider aperture or a lower F number will result in a blurrier background. Next we have TV, which is this icon here, and that stands for time value. And that's a shutter priority mode, which lets you set the shutter speed while the camera selects the aperture for you. This is useful when you want to control the amount of motion blur in your photo. In some scenarios, like when you're taking a picture of a waterfall, you may want motion blur so you'd open the shutter for longer. In other situations, like during a sporting event, you may want to capture the action and freeze the subject in the moment with no motion blur, so you need a faster shutter speed. Finally, there's this section here, which is P, and that stands for Program. In this mode, the camera sets your aperture and your shutter speed automatically, but you can adjust all the other things that affect the look of your photograph, such as the ISO and the white balance. There's quite a bit to say about exposure and the creative use of ISO, shutter speed and aperture. I can't go over the finer details of exposure in this video, but I do want to give you an idea of the types of things that you can do to control your image and hopefully inspire you to explore more on your own. So next I'm going to go over a few of the choices that you have in manual.